Well, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to another Sunday Night Live drawing session. Just before I was about to hit go live, I got notification that Amazon delivered some stuff I ordered. So I'm I know what it all is, but I figured I'd make those ASMR signs sounds of opening stuff. Um, because who doesn't love that? I I was on Amazon. I know we're not supposed to use it, Amazon, but uh, you know sometimes needs must. Oh, that just becomes a book I get to add to this. And here's a box of stuff. This is more practical stuff. I probably won't share this online. You know what? I gotta say, Anzen, I I love that you you immediately know that I'm I'm stressed about the sound, and I'm almost afraid to ask because that kind of means restarting without an actual link that I shared earlier in the week. Um, I, I honestly, okay, so if you are connected with me on social media, you may have seen some of my messages about uh, screwing up my eyes earlier this week. On, uh, was it Thursday morning? I think it was Thursday morning. Time doesn't mean anything. I, I decided it was time to do a little bit of spring cleaning on my balcony. It was, uh, it's been raining the last little while, but my, my balcony is generally dry. But living on the fifth floor of a 10 floor building, I mean, there's detritus that falls from the upper floors, intentional or not. Uh, plus, you know, Toronto, there's pigeons. And just road dust, because I'm, I'm not too far from the highway. And there's like, you know, just cities are dirty places, man. So time to clean it. I wanted to enjoy my balcony this summer. So I went out and I started sweeping. And as I'm sweeping, this weird out of nowhere, it wasn't windy at all, but this gust of wind comes out and all the dust that I didn't aggressively sleep in the balcony gets blown in my face. And I felt it go in my eyes. So I stopped everything. I literally just started. I think I, 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 I hit the broom like three or four times and then the gust hit. I rinsed out my eyes. Didn't matter. Eye infection. Both eyes. So um, I think I'm on, I'm on the, uh, what you would call the downhill side of uh, the infection. So I should be 100% better. I can draw now. I wasn't able to draw, you know, at all Thursday night or Friday. I tried. Saturday, I was able to finish some stuff. If you follow me on Patreon, you saw that I finished some stuff finally. But I essentially lost two days. But before I go back and attempt, I went and got myself some nice little eye protection. They're not full, full goggles, but this should be enough to keep the dust out of my eyes. Um, so I'm protected. Yes. So this just arrived from Amazon. Plus, for future protection, because I know uh, it's a better rinse to use uh, a sterile eye wash. So I got some of these just to have on hand in case this ever happens again, because I hate losing time for like eye injuries. I've had the shittiest year so far. And I also got some, uh, some eye support in terms of blue team. But, but... The eyes are better and you'll be able to draw tonight. You can even see the blue pencil sort of savage land road here. Uh, I spent all day on this. Um, I, I couldn't, I was going to do savage land rogue up here, but I real, realized compositionally open sky here is better than, than a logo. So I think, I think this is going to be first piece of a little while. Well, no, the Hellboy didn't have any, any logo on it. Uh, but the first superhero without a logo. Um, but this book just, just arrived. Boom. The Art of Ron Lesser, Volume 1, Deadly Dames and Sexy Sirens. Um, now, I'm not sure about the production quality. Uh, some, of, some of it's really, really well done. Some of the stuff, I think, is from scans uh, or online pictures upscaled. Uh, there's some, there, I mean, but this guy's work is everywhere. I mean, um, when I, I didn't know this book was out there, but I mean, it, yeah, he did book covers forever. So if you have any books from the seventies, you got his stuff. Um, but this is, this is the first piece I had ever uh, realized that, you know, this is a guy uh, whose work I loved. His movie posters are great. In fact, I referenced this. I did an alt cover for Tim Seeley and oh god I'm blanking Aaron Campbell and I was blanking Aaron Campbell I'm blanking the name of the artist because the artist is really good nice nice Sam Glansman line work 
Um, they do a, uh, a vampire horror Western out of Vault. And I'm, uh, I think it's called Sunset. And I did a riff on this for the cover. And it was really fun. Um, it's, it's somewhere online. But uh, I love this guy's painting. Uh, he's all over. I love it. It's not so much the highly realistic stuff. He seems to do a lot, uh, especially later in his career. Um, but I mean, I mean, he's still working. I mean, look at this. This is, well, I don't know still, but you know, atomic bond, the hyper realistic stuff doesn't do a lot for me. This is the stuff that gets me, gets me hot. I mean, look at this painting. Oh, can I get rid of that glare. There we go. Look at that. Like simple colors, limited modeling, nice patterning, some nice texture. I just love this. I'm going to get back to do more painting. So it's, it's, um, I'm trying to think. There's a couple of other artists uh, from this era that do work I just love. Um, you know what? Instead of talking about them, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll bring it on next week. Uh, there's some great, great art. But I love this era of paperback covers and painting. Uh, I think a lot of it was gouache. Um, here, this feels, because it's very fuzzy, it's blurry. It, it, it's, I think, because you have this here, I have a feeling that this is an up scan of the painting. I bet they didn't have access to the original. Um, it's so easy to tell when you see in print when it's like, you hear every line is perfect for this uh, Civil War painting, which again, this is not the type of stuff I, I dig from him. Um, this is the stuff, this, this gritty pulp novel stuff. Uh, Hard Case Crime, I believe that's the name of the publisher, is doing a lot of stuff like paintings like this. Uh, you got to use Steve Holland. Everyone used Steve Holland in that era. But, I mean, oh, look at this painting. I just love the simplicity and the graphics of it. I, I so want to do like a, a, a crime comic with this type of cover art, um, but it'd have to be a horror crime book. So I, I, I don't think I... I have a couple of good, I think, good crime novel ideas or story ideas, but I like I, horror kind of, I kind of need to keep that horror going. Um, just, just beautiful stuff. Let me go a little bit faster because I, I actually have a little pile. Look at that. Oh, look at that shape. Oh my God. So much good stuff. This guy is so good. So I think this was like 40 bucks on Amazon. That's 40 bucks Canadian. Um, so it's probably like 35 US, 30, 35 US. So if you like this type of art, um, I highly recommend getting it. Uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, here's more recent stuff where you start getting a little more realistic, but that's that's what the market wanted. Like this type of really soft, kind of like romancy type artwork. I get it, but I, I mean, I love the composition, the way it just kind of, it's like a ripped paper coming through with all this room for the, the text is in white. I think that's lovely. I wish they didn't add this weird paper texture, but that's probably because this is a digital scan of the book and they, they cleaned it up. Um, it's, a, it's a little sad that they do that. Um, but I mean, if you don't have access, did I see a Batman? Clearly, I, 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 I've never seen him do a Batman. Whoop, boobs, can't, can't have boobs. Oh, that's kind of terrible, isn't it? Oh, this must've been a commission. Because this is this is not his best work. That Batman is ill considered. Um, well, I hate I hate being so, but look at that. Uh, I mean, okay, they're going to do a volume two uh, and three. I'll get that. But here, this is also again a scan. It, it's close enough. It's big enough. It's nice enough. Um, it, it really has that nice Robert McGinnis, and that's that's who I'll, I'll bring the book up next time. Has that lovely Robert McGinnis touch. Um, wow, hang on. Did I do this? Okay, that explains a lot. This is done on the cheap. This was this is print on demand out of Amazon, manufactured by Amazon.ca Bolton, Ontario. So that means is they're collecting the book, they're designing it, they're doing a PDF, and they're not printing up a bunch. This is actually pretty damn good for digital printing. I can I can see some of the color breaks in the digital printing now that I'm looking for it. But still, it's a it's a really nice, affordable book. Um, it has some, it has some really good reproductions. I'm going to read it. So that'll be fun. This is beautiful. That looks like, um, uh, Elizabeth Taylor and that's Steve Holland again. So that, that's probably his reference. So 
yeah. So I love I love this era of paperback books. Um, next up, I wonder if I should do these at the end or at the beginning. But it feels like the beginning is the best place. Let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Excellent, Brendan. Hi, hi, Brendan. Uh, and to say hi to Brendan. By the way, everyone, Brendan's my son. He's like a giant. He's like six foot seven. Um, this I got this a while ago, and I think it's appropriate because I'm doing Savage Land store, uh, Rogue tonight. This is Mark Nelson's Thunder Hunters. It was uh, 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 crowdfunded on Zoop last year, and um, so beautiful. I have been a Mark Nelson fan since I first saw, saw some role playing game illustrations from him in the early 80s. The first comic I saw him do, and it might have been his first comic, was adapting not adapting, doing the Aliens Black and White series for Dark Horse Comics. It was one of the first indie licensed books that became a massive hit. And uh, and I, I think the reason we have so many licensed movie comics like Aliens, Predator, all all that stuff is is because of Mark Nelson and Mark, for, I think it was Mark Verheiden. Pretty sure it's Mark Verheiden. Did such an amazing job in that first Alien series. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. I just love his work. Uh, he's always posting these amazing designs. He did a his tippins, his tippin designs for um, uh, for this book. I wish, in hindsight, I wish I got one. Uh, or just stunning. He did this full page illustration, and he did these beautiful little drawings in each one. Just gorgeous. I think I think they overprinted enough for you to be able to get some of these. So either look at Mark Nelson's website or somewhere online, or maybe even check in with Zoop to see if they get extra copies. This is beautiful. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. I'm very happy to have it. Uh, something else that arrived. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Zoe Thurgood's, um, God, what's it called again? The Floating Center of the Earth book. That's terrible. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm about to praise this character, this artist's work. Um, her follow-up book to this. Um, is brilliant. It's semi-autobiographical. Um, so I think this one is too. Um, I got this, haven't had a chance to re read it. I flipped through it. There is a massive, between this and the other book, which has got the world on fire, uh, there's a massive uptick in, in capability, um, understanding of the medium, just drawing ability. Uh, I still think I'm probably going to enjoy reading this when I make the time to, to read it. I mean, she's just such a good talent. She's always thorough of it. Um, yeah, okay. This is good. Okay. All right. Uh, I got this. Um, I don't think, did I show this last week? I love that they're reprinting some of the famous uh, artist school books. Um, uh, a lot of it's beginner stuff that... Um, not to sound you know arrogant or anything, but it doesn't really apply to me as much. But it's great to see how they teach it, and every once in a while you glean some of uh, something from it that you you just never saw put that well. Uh, so this is another book I'm going to read. It's really informational. You get to see, you really get to see how these classic top notch illustrators did their work. I mean, oh my god, look at this! Can you see that? That's gouache. So it, it's probably black ink on blue gouache with, with some white. And it's just, oh, my God, so good. Rockwell. Photo reference that he worked from. All that, that famous thing about uh, um, uh, playing telephone. I love that piece. Just, just good drawing right across the board. Uh, I, right now, I think my favorite one of this line is the animals book because they've done stuff in drawing animals. I haven't seen other drawing animals books. So, so it's a good one. Oh yeah, should I do a fourth book or should I save it for next? I can do one more book and I'll, I'll save this other book in the stack for next week. I got this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez is probably one of the all-time great comic artists in the medium. Uh, I think he's unheralded um outside of people who work um his drawing ability is just astounding 
Um, in his early days, he got some of the worst possible anchors and it just buried him. And I think there was some awkwardness in his early work. But when you start getting to, and this is, I think this is volume two. I think there's another Batman book. I know there's two Superman books. He did a lot of Superman work and stuff. But I mean, if, as soon as you get to the really contemporary, you can look in this on the side, and as soon as you see the when it gets dark, that when he starts doing bleed, that's the contemporary stuff, and that's when he's like, he's definitely getting the respect he needs. He's inking himself, or he's being inked by Kevin Nolan. Um, if you were a fan of the Amalgam comics from back in the '90s, he's the guy who drew Doctor Strange Fate, inked by Kevin Nolan. I mean, just look at this. Oh my God. Oh, he just. He could draw everything and anything. He did this great series called Twilight that Howard Chaykin wrote. And it is just astounding. Um, it's, it's, it's considering that Howard did layouts for it. And here's a Batman black and white story. I'm really happy they didn't color it for this. Um, Howard did layouts for it. So it's, it's the best Howard has ever looked. <laughs> I think he would agree. Um, but this guy could just, I think this is another Kevin Nolan piece. It looks like Kevin Nolan line work. I think this was, um, when they introduced King Tut to the Batman universe. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. It's, I'm pretty sure it's Kevin Nolan. And I think this is Garcia Lopez inking himself again. Batman 60. I, I never saw this book at all. I'm pretty sure this is him inking himself. Hang on. Uh, yep. Uh, art by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, colors by Alex Sinclair. Some pretty nice colors. So I didn't know about this book. I think I saw it. I stumbled across it uh, while looking for something else. So gorgeous, gorgeous book. I got more books. I'll save them for next time. So I, I, I gotta say, I love, I love my never-ending, <laughs> ever-growing library of art books. I'll probably have to do a purge at some time soon because my apartment isn't that big, but you know, you, you do what you can. All right. So if you don't follow me on Patreon, you didn't get to see these, but I finally finished the 30th, 30th anniversary Hellboy piece. Um, and 30th anniversary is Pearl, Pearl anniversary. So I drew some clams with some pearls and that's the whole excuse just to have Hellboy in a cave having to see, defeated some sort of giant sea king of some sort because he's, he's got oh, good, good, good out there. Yeah, I gave him a crown down here. So, yeah. So, um, I'll probably pop it on the shop. I'm overdue popping you work up on the shop. So, I'll probably I'll post this this week online and then everything. This will go in the shop on Friday. And the other thing I finished. Again, this stuff should have been done earlier in the week, but it wasn't because of the stupid eye thing. I finished Storm. So I finished Storm. Um, you can see I used a rubber stamp to establish a, uh, a skin value. So I just wanted her to separate from the white more. And I wanted the black shape here under the Storm logo so the lightning could pop. So I think, I think the lightning is kind of cool. So, yeah, so that's done. Uh, so, yeah, I'll post that on all socials uh, later in the week, and then I'll probably pop it, throw it on the shop uh, Friday. And also, um, the uh, the grace period for the current pricing for the endless pieces I did uh, going to change by Friday. I'm going to increase the prices on everything there by 25%. So I, it's kind of like a stealth sale. I, I put things up at, like, a set price. And then, you know, if it's just going to sit there until someone wants it, I'm just going to bump the price up. Um, I don't see myself actually doing sales. Um, my former art rep who still owes me money, by the way, um, they would do sales and, um, there would be people who would literally wait for those sales to happen. And then they'd buy work that they wanted because they always knew those sales were coming up. And in a, in a weird way, I feel that kind of undervalues the art. So I put up the art at a, at a slightly lower price. If it doesn't go in like two weeks, I'll, I'll move the price up and then I can just, you know, let it sit in storage until someone wants it. But uh, I'm not a big fan of sales. So, yeah, so here's Storm. And so that's Hellboy and Storm done. Um, I'm going to work on this till about, you know, 830 because I already used up about 22 minutes of our time. here talking about all those books. So this here is my Savage Land Rogue. Um, I think... Is that, oh, 
pasted? You mean the logo? You mean this the logo here? No, that's that's on the board. So I found a black and white version of one of her comic series logos and I traced it off onto the board and I did a bad job. I, I used the wrong pencil, it was all rough. And that, so I went over it and with ink to smooth it out a bit. Is it leg? No. Oh. Is the leg pasted? Nope. It's, it's all on the board. There is a slight difference. This is uh, the black here is um, super matte black Sharpie. And most of the rest of this, is, this is like uh, ink brush. So the, uh, there's a different quality. This is a little grayer, this is blacker. Is that, was that what you're asking about, Anson? Um, yeah, Clement call. I, I think earlier in my streams, I, I brought my call book. Um, I think there might be a newer one, but I missed out on it. Uh, I'll have to look. Um, uh, call is, is probably outside of like, you know, John Mishima, Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, Bernie Wrightson, some of those classic guys that I grew up with. I think call is the biggest illustrative influence on my work. Yeah, I did. I uh, I used my stand. I, I masked off everything with uh, Frisket, you know, this stuff. And uh, I very carefully cut everything um, because rubber stamps don't immediately go down. They, they're like an airbrush. They won't go right to the edge of Frisket. I have to cut the Frisket slightly outside of where I want the rubber stamp to end. So everything's rubber stamp. I even did rubber stamp on the on the legs to get that, that different different value. It's uh, the way the light's hitting it. This looks brighter on this, my screen than it does in, in person. There's always a bit of weird value shift because of the way the light hits the artwork. This this is looking darker than it is in person. This is looking lighter than it is in person. So it balances out. Um, and by pressuring the stamps, um, I can do things like get a highlight on the side of her head because I'll, I'll, I'll push a little harder light, but I won't push all the way down to get it going right up to there. And I'm learning more and more tricks. The more I use the rubber stamps, the more tricks I'm developing in terms of how to get, get these big, awkward square shapes to do exactly what I want. This is my blending. I'm going to make a bigger one. and I'm going to make a smaller one too. But it goes from like a darker, to lighter thing. I think, I think at some point I'm going to do some standalone videos that will just cover things like my rubber stamps or some of my what media I use just because so they're there uh, and they're not part of a live thing it's just so people can say well, I got a question well I got a video on that but yeah so I'm going to do a video on this rubber stamp soon and I use like I don't know like three different types of white I've I used um, for the lightning I used a Pentel correction pen that's that's a really bright blobby white I used my Molotow one for all white to get some of the lines, to get some of the fainter lines, I use, where is it? I used my Posca white, and of course it's hiding, so I'm not gonna dig it out. And I use a little bit of brush, and then I just use my toothbrush to splatter to get that, that, that kind of glow from the lightning. So like a stupid amount of weird little complex stuff went into getting that lightning to look like lightning. Hopefully it works. Okay, it's here. Thank you so much. I think I think the important the important thing to learn when you're working with influences is to not ape them, not not to try and become a clone or uh, a tribute act. Uh, I think what it is is you take you study the work. Um, you take what feels most comfortable from you and try and incorporate it to how you work. Um, which means you're probably, 
it, it's going to be a longer road to, to, to get to where you're absolutely, truly happy with what you're doing. So there's Cole in here. There's Wrightson. There's Buscema. There's Frazetta. Um, there's Chaikin, Sinkevich, a little bit of Dave McKean, who's also heavily influenced by Sinkevich, uh, some classic illustrators. Um, and the idea is to make it so the stew or soup that you're making out of your own art works. And hopefully I'm getting there. Uh, I don't, I think it's like kind of like a never ending thing, but yeah, so I'm pretty happy with the storm here. The angle patterns. Oh, you mean, um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I think that issue is coming out in a month um, or it's coming out the month after issue 11. I, th I think, I think it's coming out in like, like in a month, within a month, uh, Savage Sword of Conan 2, which will have that story. I got a big pile of that art. Uh, I think I've waved some of that art around on stream before. I got a massive stack of it here. Looking for something if I can share it. You know, somewhere in another pile. My studio is such a disaster. I, back during Coven last fall, um, it ended up being so much work dealing with that, that I got um, really far behind in all basically day-to-day -day stuff. So I've been perpetually playing catch up on things like laundry and dishes and cleaning, sweeping, all that stuff. And then Conan happened and, um, and some other covers and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and it's like, I'm still playing catch up. Um, I decided to, to do one thing. It's first thing. Um, I got some friends who do some things in terms of self care um, to make their lives a little bit easier, despite not being millionaires. So one of, uh, one of them, they have a uh, house cleaning come in once a week to just clean their house. So um, it just takes a little bit of the pressure off. I think, I think that's a brilliant idea. So what I did is I found a local laundry service. So beginning of every month, I just give them all my laundry because uh, there's no uh, laundry facilities in my apartment and I hate the services around here and it just takes time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I could look it up, but I, I want to get into drawing sooner, but uh, yeah. So um the weird thing is, okay, so I've never drawn, I know I've drawn Rogue before. A long time ago, in the 90s, I think I got asked to draw a couple of Rogues. Um, my, my, when he was alive, he was my best friend. Mike Ringo uh, did a brilliant Rogue series. So my, my, my thoughts of Rogue, apart from the early Paul Smith, Michael Golden, uh, that timeline uh, of Rogue X-Men stuff, pre-X-Men and X-Men stuff. My memory of Rogue is entirely what Mike did uh, with it, with Rogue, uh, that miniseries uh, with Gambit. And um, so I'd never seen the comic. It must have been an uh, X-Men issue because that's what Claremont did. Something was hot over there. He immediately grabbed it and pulled it in the X-Men. So I'd never seen the Rogue uh, comic. But I've seen Rogue Savage Land art for so long that i mean you just know about it right and um and i i had never been asked to draw her um so when i, I was deciding last week when it was storm punk rock storm or savage line rogue it was knowing i'd have to immediately look up what, you know the various designs and there's so many fan art versions of this um so I actually have a belt with the X symbol. I forgot to draw it on here. I might actually, I saw, um, oh God, what's his name? Travis Charest, who's, who's just an insanely talented guy. He did a uh, drawing, I think, last year. And, and this is largely based on my memory of that drawing. Um, 
he did a, a brilliant savage line and i think he put the x logo on one of her um boot bags um so i might do that and, and then that way i get to cover up the nipple i sketched out to make sure i press place the breast properly <laughs> I uh, see here. Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, soon. Draw. Uh, never read it. Know it. Avoided Eggsman at that point. Yeah, you know, um, I did pick up X. I, I kind of left X-Men during John Rita Jr.'s first run. I think he's done a second run since. It just, um, I, I was reading more indies, uh, becoming a lot more interested in... Um, non Claremont comics. And then the whole Claremont getting bumped, uh, Jim Lee kind of writing X-Men and the image thing started and writing just in super seemed to even get worse. And I think it was pretty much out. I mean, there would be like, you know, some writer would come along and do something really, really cool at midnight and I'd pick it up, but that's, that'd be about it. Uh, I was pretty much a vertigo boy through all the nineties. I think the only thing that would pass as a superhero comic that I was buying in that era was Hitman. And uh, <laughs> anyone who read Hitman knows that was barely a superhero book. There you go. Um, yeah, so this is my first time ever drawing uh, Savage Land Rogue. I remember the, uh, the Paul Smith uh, Savage Land story with um, Sora which I always thought was a weird name considering, you know, it comes right from uh, Lord of the Rings. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to, you know, jungle trees. I I, I kind of know what I'm going to do, so I'm not going to bother with it. I don't think I'm going to draw any critters in this because then that become, I might do a lizard, a small little dino lizard here. But I thought the nice thing would be the pterosaurs flying overhead. That just feels like a Savage Land thing. Um, all right, so let's, let's get to it. I'm going to do my usual thing and start on the head because if I script ahead, I'm just going to print it out again and start over. Luckily, I haven't, I haven't had to do that. Watch me spoil it right now. I haven't had to do that yet. Someday it'll happen. And you'll all be sitting here like listening to my printer run while I print it out again because I screwed something up. Luckily, I get a very fast printer. I think I drew the eyebrow too low, so I'm going to draw ink above it. So this is my favorite um, artboard. It's uh, Eon Vellum. It doesn't come with the uh, pre-printed uh, elements i for some reason i just i don't like those anymore um back in the early days it was such a thrill to have like marvel or dc paper that had all of the lines ruled out you just pick it up and start drawing um i just don't do that anymore i just draw to a certain size consistently and let that be it. Yeah, those eyes are doing okay so far. Let's get. I think I, 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 for me in my development as a comic book artist, like growing up on. John Buscema, who did who did excellent faces, but it was limited acting in that era. Uh, same thing with uh, Neil Adams, beautiful drawing, limited acting. Um, I think the first comic, and this was a game changer for me, was Kevin McGuire on Justice League, and and how he went to so much effort to give everyone a unique face. Uh, men, men or women, uh, he didn't have that that same face itis that so many artists previous had. And 
and his expressions were immaculate. Uh, and I, 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 was, I was in art school when that stuff was coming out. And I remember a bunch of us just sitting down looking at Kevin McGuire, Justice League Comics, going, look at that angle. Why did he pick that angle? And he's got this expression perfect. Um, and uh, so focusing on faces became really, really important to me at that point because, you know, once, once, once someone sets a bar high, you don't, you don't let it. If you want to be competitive in, a, in an industry that shouldn't be competitive, um, you have to be adapting to what the market expects. So that's that's where I'd say um, there's a certain level of competition. You have to be aware of what the industry wants, um, which makes me think because when I was on the actual fandom, I, 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 apart from some lag issues, some tech issues, it was it was a really fun little interview I did Friday night on actual fandom, um, and um, we we're talking about. Uh, don't not to get too political and even though we're living in an insanely political world right now um the difference as i see it between uh conservative comic creators and and lefties like me is i'm not in this to be better than any other artist i'm in this to be better than the artist i was yesterday and my experience was a lot of angry I hate to say it, conservative comics creators is they're desperate to be better than other people. And it has nothing to do with just being good at the comics they do. It's, it's how dare any other artist, um, you know, call claim to anything other than, you know, the artist that inspired me growing up. It's like, they wouldn't complain about Bill Sienkiewicz being a bigger deal than them. But if Jamal Igel is a bigger deal than them, they'll lose their shit. And I think that's that's deeply troubling. And I think it limits, it really truly limits what you can do as an artist. I think you have to remember every other artist out there is trying to be the best at who they are. And you don't matter. And, um, and if you're spending all your time, I think that year's too low. If you're spending all your time trying to just get better jobs than some other artist, you're not going to become a better artist. You're, you're, you're going to be focusing on the wrong aspects of what makes your work better. You have to, you, you just have to just look at your own work, understand what you're bringing to the table and work to improve it. And too many young artists are way too focused on um, getting the gig that another artist is getting. And that's just unhealthy. I think that face is all right. So does that look like a rogue face? I think that looks like a rogue face. I think she'd be wearing lipstick in the Savage Land. And she's not like, uh, what's that character? Polaris, who has like, you know, distinctly colored lips. What the year to... Obviously, the flow is going to draw more years than I was originally planning to. Then I have. I mean, we're living in a shadow of uh, World War Three almost starting yesterday, so I think we can be a little bit political. I'm going to get too much line work on that neck because I want her to look young. Kirk 
that chin out a bit. You know, it's it's okay. So this is this is the weird thing. I'm 56, which uh, may seem ancient to some, but in terms of like geek culture, I'm only old in as much as that a number of things became a big deal after I was outside the target market. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Transformers, GI Joe animated series, and the X Men animated series. They all came after. I was no longer in the target target market market. So I got all these friends who were just a few years younger than me who completely lose it, you know, with, with the idea of doing something with Transformers or Turtles or G.I. Joe comes up. They get so incredibly excited. And I have a hard time caring. I've heard, I've actually heard that the new X-Men series, the X-Men 97 series, um, is 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 being done at a level that no one expected it's like stupidly high quality writing um but again that's coming from fans and i wasn't a fan of the series not out of like any sort of like um snobbery or anything it's just like i was i think at that point i was like super invested into crime fiction crime movies horror movies that stuff that that was the stuff that was driving i really I, I was never really a video game guy either uh so when people are like raving about like certain certain video games um like i guess sega or sonic or whatever all that all that stuff that that just kind of eludes me that was after the time i was long out of the audience um so if the word of mouth is insane um I will watch it. I will try it. But I will say that I'm currently a bit of a snob when it comes to writing. Uh, the stuff that really, really gets me really excited right now is like the current Shogun series is amazing. I love it. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like you're watching a series and you go, oh, my God, I want to do a comic about this. And, and that's just the storyteller in me. Um, I think there's a part of me that would hate doing anything too involved in historical fiction but drawing those samurai for like a, a short story or something that would be that would be nuts i'd love that I'm gonna thin our neck down a bit i'm gonna pop a bit i'm gonna have the headband come out from there It's, it's one of the weird things that you learn in fan, fandom is there's going to be some people who are upset. Yes. Yes. Um, I tried watching um, Ripley. We were talking about the talented. I love the lead actor, but the director is, he's doing things. He's abusing certain video, video techniques that are, as a storyteller myself, I drove me to frustration. Um, it, it stopped my ability. So I, I, I was out with one episode. Um, um, I don't even think I finished watching the episode. It's just the, the weird kind of like fisheye security camera lens stuff. It's, it's too much to me. Um, you, you, you can't get in the way. You use an effect. If it works, great. Um, but you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta control yourself. Um, I might actually go back and do some white paint with the, the her whiter hair here and make sure I don't have, I don't have character reference. I mean, not, I know that she has that white thing. And I know some people did that almost like a skunk thing, like a Pepe Le Pew thing with her hair going all the way back. Um, But uh, I think I'll draw the hair, then I'll come back in and, and make sure that I get that white hair happening properly. I 
I'm using a three for the hair because I want like thick, chunky lines. In pearly, pearly. <laughs> Well, you know what? Without disagreement, with too much agreement spoils everything. Um, so the disagreement. See, the thing is, I love that lead actor so much. I ended up watching what was actually otherwise a pretty bad science fiction movie where he was playing a, you know, it was really bizarre in the sense they were living in a high rise luxury apartment building. And there's like apparently only two people living there. And his parents were dead, but he ended up going back to his hometown and there, there were his parents from when he was younger and he was like dealing with that. I got the idea of it, but it was so, to me, self-indulgent narratively that I, I, I just felt it wasn't good. And then I'm talking to a friend of mine who loved it and he loved it from a performance standpoint. And um, uh, there's certain things I love about what actors do there's certain things i love about what directors do but if they put themselves above the story um so often it just kills my interest in it and that's a me thing that's not a critical assessment thing i i don't i don't let that get in my way of judging whether or not something's good or not but it will impede my ability to enjoy something so with ripley with with all the different video stuff that's just um it didn't feel in the time i gave it it didn't feel like it was enhancing the narrative as much as saying hey look at me i'm doing cool things with with, with direction and i got a hard i got a hard time with that I, i'm i'm very old school when it comes to like you know tell the story first then do the cool shit Yeah. Um, you know, you know, okay. Uh, Oral Studio, uh, which is a clever name, by the way. Um, exactly. I mean, it's like I almost immediately hated shaky cam for action. Um, people are still using it because it means they don't have to choreograph as well. Um, that uh, the raid was such a brilliant it's like i understood when shaky but cam came in in like the first born movie it added a certain level of kineticism and it wasn't at that point it wasn't necessarily overdone it was just flashy and it allowed you to get a sense of the action uh by imparting those cuts to the uh, the viewer. So you're, you're feeling a little disoriented while you're watching the action because you would be a little disoriented if you're in the middle of that action. I got that. But it got to the point where it's like you would have unnecessary cuts in the middle of a fight scene just to have more cuts. Um, and then it seemed to spread outside of action sequences. I remember, I remember watching um, that Queen movie. And there's one scene where they're sitting around a table talking and I was sitting there going, oh, my God, there's just so many edits in the scene. It doesn't make sense. And, and it's an, a director who's usually pretty damn good. So it makes me wonder if, like, how much of that was done in, in the editing suite without his involvement. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. He's, he's a pretty good director. He used to be a child actor. Um, and then uh, I think about two months later, I saw someone did a video on over-editing movies. And they use that sequence, and I, 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 you know, patted myself on the back for being so smart. But um, I'm a big fan of um, show that you know what you're doing. Tell the story first, and if you got a visual flair that you think will really enhance the story, go for it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's 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 how we work. And uh, Ripley was. Just using a little too much stuff. Oh, well, that that makes sense. That really makes sense. Um, I know guerrilla filmmaking will. 
any, any sort of uh, filmmaking with a limitation will, will drive changes. Uh, I remember uh, hearing a story that uh, Cameron shooting Terminator, the first one, they shot in a ton of areas they didn't have permits for. And if I understand correctly, there were some uh, actors who were wearing cop uniforms. And at one point, cops showed up, and the actors pretended to be cops who were actually working security. And they said, yeah, we, uh, we wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't a permit. Um, I mean, you, you do what you can with what you got. Um, and sometimes it leads to brilliance. Uh, sometimes it leads to like, oops. oops. I'm going to do a little bit more line work up here because of the, some of the white might be coming all the way through here. But I'm pretty sure this is all going to be dark hair here. I will pull highlights out of it after. It's white paint because it's what I do. I'm pretty sure I've seen that Jackie Chan video. I'm pretty sure it's the uh, the approach to cinematography is really interesting. If you have actors who know exactly what they're doing, and you have a good choreograph choreographer, choreographer, I'm gonna bungle that up. I'm thinking about the Matrix movies, where where they showed until they went crazy with CGI. Um, they showed the fights, they trained, they choreographed, they knew exactly what they were shooting versus now, um, you, you, you can have actors who don't train at all. They're like doing stuff on the fly. I can do an under boob here. We're going to get some rogue under boob. I haven't seen that in other rogue Savage Line pieces. So maybe I'm transgressing, but I want to do a little bit of under boob because who doesn't like under boob? Other than, you know, the person whose under boob is exposed. I, I, I think everyone's heard the news that they're doing a Matrix 5. Because despite intention, from what I understand it, uh, one of my friends did some um, post work on it. He used to, used to do pre-production. Now he does post-production because he's old. Um, he was telling me that um, while working on it, he was literally told by someone close to uh, the one Wachowski sister working on it that they made it hoping it would tank so no one would come back while they were alive to try and make another uh, Matrix sequel because they didn't want to do it. Uh, apparently, there was a whole bunch of studio interference in the uh, two Matrix sequels um, that made the experience for the Wachowskis terrible. And they didn't want to do more uh, Matrix movies even then. It's like there's apparently they weren't, everyone thought they were given like carte blanche to do whatever they wanted and they weren't. Uh, it was just, it was a hit. So the studio decided to get involved, which is, you know, so typical. I could put an X right there, like an X-Men symbol X. I'm going to think about that. I'm, I'm not sure if I want to do that quite yet. Oh, God, that's right. I remember there's um, one of the actresses that, that, that might be the one who did it. She wore this almost non-existent, like, silvery uniform. And after Star Trek, she went on to do porn. And she actually wore that outfit in at least one production, apparently. Oh, 60s never change.
<clears throat> okay, pair of twigs. Hang on, see here. Um, pair of twigs or bones. Not not following that. Sorry. I'm a, I am a little distracted because I'm a, I'm 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 a drawing here. Um, so I might be missing your point because you know that 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 just happens. Trying to give her a bit of a different body shape from Storm. Um, for Storm, I went and I looked at a lot of um, uh, African figures from the region I think she's from. I can't remember. I, I'm blanking. Oh, you know, I'm going to do something here. So a little bit more black there. A little bit more black there. Just uh, enhance that neck there. There we go. Um, so I wanted to give her kind of a uh, curvier, like an actual like wider hips, uh, slightly thicker thighs look. And with Rogue here, even though she's in the same general, you know, woman proportions, I'm making her a little bit more muscular uh, because she's kind of like a heavy hitter in the comics and slightly longer, more muscular legs, which is slightly different from the, the thick thighs uh, that I gave Storm. Which you know you can't see because they're you know off camera. So so hopefully even though it's still me drawing that they actually look like different women. So that's um, I overthink things. That's that's one of the ways I overthink them. Oh oh I see what you mean. Yeah I could actually I could give her like a little like. Considering her spears made, uh, and she's got all these strips, I could give her like a little uh, necklace where she actually, you know, makes it out of twigs. So she could have a little X necklace she makes for herself. So like she's alone in the jungle, and here she is making um, her an X Men symbol, so she doesn't let, lose that. I like that idea. See, I was just going to do it on the fabric, but uh, I could give her that. Yeah, it's a good idea. That's a good idea. Sorry, when I look at chat, I, I, I look at it in response to other people's chats and like uh, chats I've responded to. Uh, so there's a very good chance that um, someone will actually say something in response to what I said. And I won't even get it. See, weirdly enough, if if. I'm hearing really, really, really good things about Fallout. I've never played the game. I actually think I installed the first edition and it was like really early video game stuff and it was like clunky as hell. So I, I quit. <laughs> I think I bought the game, installed it, played 20 minutes and I can't figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do here. And I just uninstalled it and tossed it. Um, but I'm hearing so many good things. I love Walter Goggins. He's so good in everything he, he does. Um, I will watch Fallout. I'm hearing so much good word of mouth on it. And as I understand it, the they've already uh, okayed the uh, second season. And they had done so before the first season even wrapped. Uh, production. They, they were just so happy with it. So I will watch Fallout. I, um, Halo, I didn't enjoy. Um, I got to watch my son playing a ton of Halo as he was growing up with his Xboxes and stuff like that. So I'm aware of it. I think um, based on watching, I think the first four or five episodes of the first season, um, they didn't get the point of the series. And I'm, I'm saying this is someone who's only tangentially aware of Halo. Um, it, is, it is amazing when the writers get what they're working on. Uh, Last of Us, I, I think because I think one of the writers was one of the, the devs for the game. Um, that that kind of makes it easier. But you think about how often they just screw everything up. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, what, what else? Uh, I liked um, the gentleman. I think it was called the gentleman. It was it was the uh, the guy inherits the estate that has a um, a pot farm on it. I thought that was fun. It was Guy Ritchie. I don't expect anything of a super high quality from Guy Ritchie. I just expect that kind of money was fun. 
I heard good things about rendition. It has Jake Gyllenhaal in it, and he's really good in pretty much anything, even though he always looks a little creepy. So that's that's how I eventually watch that that list. Um, oh, um, just just bouncing around subject to subject. Um, I loved Roadhouse. Yeah, exactly. Gentlemen was fun trash. And I think as adults, we're allowed to like fun trash. I, 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 I endeavor to always, always leave room for um, bad stuff that's so well done, you love it. Um, Roadhouse, I think, falls solidly into that. It was so much better than it had any right being. Uh, I, I wholly agree with Doug Lyman's uh, upset that they didn't get a theatrical release. I think they would have made bank. But I also understand why Amazon decided not to because they wouldn't have had a hit this big if they released it in theaters first. Uh, I, I think Roadhouse was so good. Um, yeah, Susie Glass is a great character. Uh, I'm looking forward to the second season. I hope, hope to maintain the level. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. It, he's one of those lead actors who, in all honesty, is just an insanely talented character actor. Uh, that's my take on him. Um, I, I, I kind of got a crush on Jessica Jones. Um, it was kind of sort of there because, and she's cute. She's kind of my type. Um, but then I saw her in Shrinking, and I kind of fell in love with her. So she's just that good. Um, Everyone else in the movie was kind of either cute or forgettable. Um, I hope I don't. I hope they don't bring McGregor back for any sequel if they do a sequel. Um, I felt he was obnoxiously loud and unenjoyable. Uh, I knew what they were trying to do with his character, and it didn't land for me. He was just so hissably bad. And over the top from the very first time he's on screen, um, that I just couldn't, just couldn't enjoy him. I mean, he was he, the fight scene was amazing, and probably was amazing because he was so believable in it. But um, give me, a, I'd, I'd much rather take someone who's less physically impressive who can give me a performance I'll, I'll thoroughly enjoy than someone who, uh, yeah, like, I, I don't need Gina Carano in any movies. I mean, just because she's believable when she's moving doesn't mean she's, you know, worthwhile having on screen. Yeah, you know what? That, that's a great take. I, I would like to see a sequel. Um, and a sequel doesn't necessarily have to be in the same place. It doesn't even have to have Jake Gyllenhaal in it. It could be another, just another same situation, like, you know, uh, True Detective, make it an anthology series. Uh, I'd be, I'd be cool with that. Uh, I'm more than happy to see Jake Gyllenhaal in pretty much anything. Uh, I think he was, there's, uh, uh, The Sisters Brothers was kind of like one of those weird, almost good movies. And um, weirdly enough, I think Jake Gyllenhaal's character in, in, the, in the Sisters Brothers made it work. Yeah, yeah, Jack Reacher does. And honestly, okay, so I wasn't in love with, there's something, I think it came out that um, the lead actor, Richardson, is on the spectrum. And uh, which made me Forgive a lot of the weirdness, but it actually informs performance nicely because then Reacher comes across as being on the spectrum. And a friend of mine said, oh, you can't you can't support him because he's like a really devout Christian. And I asked him, is, is he a really devout Christian or is he an American Christian? And the guy said, oh, I don't know. I, I He was just told that, you know, Richardson actually has a YouTube channel where he talks about his belief in God. And I think it was this week where Richardson basically came out. And he was not an American evangelical. He, he basically said Trump has no business running for president. And at that point, okay, I'm absolutely cool with Alan Richardson 
doing whatever he wants. I'll probably see um, that movie with Cavill. Um, it looks bonkers. That might be a Guy Ritchie movie too. Uh, it looks bonkers fun, and I will I will check it out because I like him more now. But I probably would have seen it anyway because it looks bonkers fun. The thing I like that made between between um, Reacher and Roadhouse is Gyllenhaal's character was really messed up. I mean, he killed his buddy and he had to live with that and they didn't really delve into it too much, which is good. I mean, that just made for uh, uh, better film work, but it was clearly he was processing it, which um, you don't really see that level of, of smart in uh, action movies. They, they just let us, you know, understand that, that that's what's happening. And I really appreciated that. Oh, I'm working on camera here. I'm sorry, guys. I just realized that as soon as I drop below the belly button, I'm gone. Um, how are we doing time-wise? 10 minutes? You know, well, uh, without moving the camera, let me work on the pterod pterodactyls. Pterodons? Um, hey, you know what? I just realized there's a series that no one talks about, and I think it was really, really, really well done. And um, came out during COVID. And oh god, now it's just the name of a fellow. It it was um based on Jerusalem's uh Salem's lot, um, and the story that uh was a prequel to it. Was it called Salem's uh Jerusalem's lot? Or Chapel Wait. Might have been called Chapel Wait. Um and it's a great little horror series, 10 episodes, um, good acting top to bottom. Uh, really some really effective horror sequences in it. It never shies away from the horror of it. And it has an amazing ending that you don't see much in horror TV. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Chapel Way. So if you're looking for a series from a couple of years ago, uh, you're all caught up with everything you're watching right now. I highly recommend it. Um, trying to think. You know what? Let's let's open up. Midnight Mass. Oh my God! I love everything Flanagan does. I, I hate to say it. He, he everything he does is he's one of those filmmakers who he he just he just delivers. Uh, I'm looking forward to his. I think he's doing uh, a new TV version of Dark Tower and some other Stephen King type stuff. Um, but I love his. I love his Stephen, like Gerald's game. He did a great job with that. Um, I like the uh, Bly Manor and Haunting of Hill House, uh, which was like Edgar Allan Poe informed by Stephen King because he has that, that bone deep Stephen King appreciation going on. And I, I dig it. I dig it. So, I, I mean, I wrote fan letters to Stephen King when I was a kid. And he responded, which is really cool. I wish I, I, wish I still had them. Uh, I think they disappeared when I was in college with all the moving I was doing. Stephen King's an awesome guy. Um, they were talking about doing the Dark Tower series before the movie. They were uh, Ron Howard when he was involved, initially involved. He there was so much Dark Tower material, and anyone who read, reads those books knows there's like what is it like thirty books? I'm exaggerating, but there's a, a, an immense amount of material of different story types, and Ron Howard's vision um, was a series of movies, like theatrical release movies, an ongoing TV series that would support the movies. And some made-for-TV movies. 
that would enhance the story because there was just so much content. And, you know, Ron Howard generally gets the job done. So the fact that they didn't let him do this and they ended up with the, the one movie that didn't satisfy anyone and wasted so many talented people. Like, I mean, uh, I think that was the first real time we got to see Matthew McConaughey play uh, a bad guy. And um, it was a waste of Matthew McConaughey as a bad guy. It wasted Idris Elba as a lead character. He's so good. Imagine if instead of doing what they did, they actually set up Idris to have a character that could go longer. Um, I really like Idris. Um, even though he, he tends to do a lot of stuff I have no interest in. He did this weird London-based cowboy thing for Netflix that did nothing for me. Left me cold. Just couldn't connect with it. Um, but despite that, he was really good in it. Then he did another show, a comedy, where he was like a DJ, a uh, bit of a moocher. And he was good in it, but I didn't really connect with that either. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Yeah, yeah. I I honestly what I and and I know Martin, George R. R. Martin wanted he was really upset that Benioff and Weiss were wrapping things up so fast. He, he knew full because he had given them an outline of how the book series is supposed to end. And there was a, a tremendous amount of material to cover. And then Benioff and Weiss basically said, We're tired of it, we want to wrap it up, and we don't want to give it to someone else. And while they were doing this, they were telling all the actors who had read the books and had expectations for the characters, shut up. And the actors, of course, took it at the time because they didn't want to get fired outright or be seen as difficult. But um, it kind of established uh, in my mind that Benioff and Weiss thought that Game of Thrones was successful because of them, not because of George R. R. Martin and good casting, which I think was, I mean look at everything they did when they were using Martin material versus what they did without Martin material. And I think it, it under underscores the point that they weren't, they weren't it to my mind anyway. And they did three body problem, which I kind of think was a bit of a disaster. I don't know if it's popular, but uh, I certainly didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Three body problem. Um, it's like, I know the story. Um, there's some weird cultural stuff that I don't think would translate to a North American or Western audience in general. Um, I think, I think a lot of their changes, I understood why they made some of their changes, but they didn't work. Um, I mean, it's, so culturally different. Yeah, it had, it had, and I think a lot of it was Benioff and Weiss just kind of screwing up. I mean, it's, it's, what do you do, man? It's like, uh, these are the people who floated the idea, what if uh, the South had won the Civil War after all those complaints about how racist many of their choices were in Game of Thrones? Um, not, not, not good looks, guys. Um, not good looks. No, no, honestly, it's like I, I usually don't approach things saying I'm a fan of a showrunner because a lot of times showrunners' job is to be invisible and let the, the writing room and the actual working producers do their job. Um but uh yeah, Benny F and Weiss, not 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 a fan. I mean, I, th I think Hollywood kind of realized that, too, because it's like their Star Wars deal dried up, their HBO deal dried up, they're at Netflix now, and I'm hearing that uh, Netflix is not sure if they're going to do more work with them, because apparently they made it more difficult than it needed to be. So we're getting into the, I'm drawing off, oh my God, I did it again. There we go. That's what I'm working on. Sorry, guys. I um
Uh, scene in particular that kind of haunted me after I don't want to spoil it. Uh, you're talking about the razor wire thing from Three Body. Yeah, you know what? House of the Dragon is is the quality level I expected for the last two seasons of Game of Thrones without the Martin material. Like they had an outline. They tell the story. It's not. It's not amazing. Like season three of Game of Thrones is, I think, perfect TV. Um, I think that was the Red Wedding season. I could, if I mis misremember, I'm sorry. But the season where they had the Red Wedding, everything was just like, bam, bam, hit after hit after hit. It was it was perfect TV uh, in terms of like you know adaptation stuff. Um, House of the Dragon is because I, essentially because if if you if you guys know about it uh <laughs> there, there, i did some work on it <laughs> uh I, uh that's me losing track of the camera sorry about that guys uh i'm gonna i'm gonna stay up here i'm gonna focus on the, i'm gonna focus on the spear now that'll be nice um i am i am looking forward to more house of the dragon uh with that series i don't mind i have a habit of there's a weird little, I think I made a mark on a different layer with my pencil for drawing here. So there's a weird dark line here. I'm going to have to paint, the, paint that over. I don't think it shows up. Super, super fine. It almost looks like a hair right there. Yeah, it's, um, if you will need a fantasy fix for TV, I think House of the Dragon is okay. It's not great. Some of the acting is great. Um, they cast really well. Um, some of the choices are a little heavy handed in terms of narrative to my mind. So I've seen sketches of rogue spear and it's obviously a stone spear. Now I've watched a lot of videos on how they would have made spears and the rogue spear is this big chunky mess. So it can't be flint. So I'm wondering if it's like some sort of like magic Savage Land metal that can uh, still be effective, even though it's like poorly made. The other thing I'm realizing, um, some books just don't translate to TV very well. Is it obsidian glass? Because I'm going to go darker with it. It really shouldn't be that big. I'm going to go darker with it. Yeah, I got to say, he's... Um, he was really mediocre in pretty much everything I've seen him in since Doctor Who. And I wasn't a fan of his Doctor Who either. Um, and I'm not, it's children's entertainment. So it's like, I'm not a huge Doctor Who fan anyway, because I'm, I'm not a child. Uh, I like David Tennant. I like Den David Tennant's energy. Um, I can watch him pretty much anything. Uh, and I know he's a good actor, but um, it wasn't until House of the Dragon where they gave him a character where he could really excel in. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the uh, uh, with um, the War Doctor, um, one of my favorite actors whose name just jumped right on my head. I'm, I'm seeing him uh, to the point where I like I like his performance in that in that uh, the War Doctor bit so much. I almost uh, commissioned someone to make that scarf for me because I liked it. Um, they were good together, but I I I think part of that is is I think Matt Smith rises to the level of people he's he's bouncing off of and the material he's been given to work with, whereas David Tennant elevates the people he's working with and the material he's working from. Um, if that makes sense. Um, again, Matt, it's, it's, Matt Smith is a good actor. David Tennant's a good actor. Matt Smith does the, uh, does the best possible job with the work given him. David Tennant improves the work given him. 
John Hurt. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I ended up bailing. My son was uh, really enjoying Doctor Who, so I was watching a lot of Doctor Who with him. Um, but that the Matt Smith era was just too, like, what the hell, man? All right, I'm almost drawing off. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. If, if you've seen Good Omens, even the second season, which is not as good as the first season, of course. Um, oh, it's Hamlet. Um, I've seen, I seen a video excerpt of his performance of Hamlet. I haven't seen the, the entire performance. Um, he's also really good where he's playing the serial killer. Blank in the name of it. I saw it years ago. He plays this creepy Scottish serial killer based on a true story. <laughs> so good in it. But um, David Tennant, playing off Michael Sheen and Good Omens. Oh my God. They're like, they're so perfect. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I've heard numerous complaints about the writing quality and the production stuff from people more closely tied into what was going on there. And um, uh, again, most of my connections are in North American uh, production uh, for TV and movies. So it's like I can't claim to know anything about what, what's going on in the UK. I got friends who are a lot closer tied to that than I am. Um, I'm just going to put a whole bunch of stuff hanging off the spear because I just think that'd be cool. She's in the savage land with too much time to kill, so she's going to she's going to do weird shit. Beads and bones and stuff hanging off the tip of her spear. I mean, she's like super strong, so she could put whatever the hell she wants in that spear and still throw it through buildings. As far as buildings exist in the savage land, throw it through Sabu, saber saber tooth tigers. Yeah, I, I really thought the first I, I was I was um, I watched the first season and I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. And then it was it was really I think uh, the second Matt Smith season I was kind of like, what the hell am I doing watching this? Um, so that feels much more like a writer's loss than anything else to me. I could be wrong. Yeah, I thought the Weeping Angels were good for what they were used, but they ended up returning to so many things. Um, and it's like the more you show the monster, the less effective the monster gets. And I think I think everyone's learned that from from Alien. Um, to the point where it's like aliens are so overexposed just with it honestly was it like seven movies so alien aliens alien three alien four alien five uh prometheus covenant aliens versus predator one and two so that's that's nine movies holy crap um i mean i of course i'm gonna watch the uh the fede alvarez um alien movie because i mean he, he knows he knows horror uh so i'm there um but uh yeah yeah the more exposure any any monster gets yeah covenant covenant is a good movie it's just not a good alien movie it's a great mad scientist movie did i talk about this already Prey was so good. I'm so looking forward to uh, the sequels they're planning. Okay, so this is Obsidian. This is going to get darker here. So I'm going to do some. 
I'm going to go really dark here. Some cross hatching here. And then I'm going to do some more rendering. In here. First time I saw the, there's a heart blocking the word, and that was Legion. Oh, oh, um, was she in Legion? You're talking about the series with uh, the guy with the, uh, that actor with the really, really cool, crazy eyes. Um, and blank out. He's in King Tong Godzilla, which I still haven't seen yet. Uh, I want to. We'll see it with my son. He's just he's finally got a whole bunch of sets firing off here in in Canada. So it's like he needs that work. Uh, so I haven't been able to see it yet. I think it was Aubrey Plaza in Legion, though. Oh, really? All right. Night, Brendan. That's and that's who I was talking about, you know, wanting to see Godzilla Kong with. Um, yeah, very well be. I haven't watched Legion since um I think about a year or so after it aired. I I, I came to it late. I missed uh the first couple seasons because I didn't even know about it. I saw some Bill Sinkevich art for it, and I thought it was a movie coming up, and and then you know, found out it was a TV series later. Dan Stevens, that's what I'm thinking about. Dan Stevens is so good. Still on camera, good. Yeah, that's her name. Yeah, yeah. She was just so good in Prey. Oh, my God. And you know, all, the, all the typical whiny boys got all upset about it being so good and her fighting. And it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it was so good. I watched it, I think, three or four times just because of how well it was done. And it's amazing. It's like everyone, at, going into that, everyone knows what the Predator is. And they were still able to make a stunning, suspenseful movie out of it. And I still want them to make a samurai versus uh, uh, Predator movie. Mainly because, you know, the um, Adrian Brody, who was also in Chapel Way, uh, Adrian Brody Predators movie that had the, the one uh, uh, Yakuza face off against uh, Predators with a samurai sword. Um, I just think that would be cool. Or, or Vikings versus Predators. I'd like that. Yeah, you know, the, the one my favorite thing to do whenever I encounter someone who claims that everything is becoming woke is what do they mean by woke? Define woke. And they can't. They really can't. Because woke doesn't come from trying to make everything, you know, painfully progressive. Woke comes from just being aware. And they don't get that. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, it's 8.30. Damn it. All right. You know what? Um, this is going to be another piece I'm going to finish this week, hopefully, assuming my eyes get all better. Um, no idea right now. Hey, let's... Okay, got a few minutes here. Any suggestions of what I should draw next week? I think episode one of Star Trek was woke. <laughs> Young Conan. <laughs> oh, that, that's a good idea. Very child, baby Conan. No, born on the battlefield. Uh, Teen Conan. That would be, you know, Conan at the Sack of Anarium or or first arrival in, in uh, well, there's also Tower of the Elephant. Um, uh, I mean, we did chat about that. Um, Driver's Ed Conan. 
<laughs> okay, Conan's a good good suggestion. Any other ideas? The last bone bender. <laughs> Conan's good. I mean, um, I may, what I might do is I might wait. I'll, this week I'll double check to see when Savage Sword uh, shipping. And what I might do is either the Sunday before or the Sunday right after it's out, I'll do a Conan night. That, that seems smarter to me. Green Lantern's cool. I haven't drawn Green Lantern in, in forever. And I can do, there's so many Green Lanterns to choose from. Well, you know what? It's um, left to my own devices. I'm probably going to draw Hellboy again. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, a witch. Um, what, I, what I, I mean, part of this is it's, it's participatory entertainment. I'm drawing live for your enjoyment. So I think it just makes sense to open up the suggestions here. Viking dude, that would be cool. I could uh, LARP live action role play Hellboy. <laughs> or you mean I draw, I dress up as Hellboy. I don't know if I could hold my pens with that gauntlet. Um, I could draw one of the Vikings from uh, We Bring Only Death, but that's, uh, I'm not entirely sure if I love the character design, but it'd be cool to draw just like a, a terrifying uh, Viking. Um, Rain Fair Hellboy. <laughs> Um, hmm. Good suggestions so far. Come on, give me something different though. Give me, give me like two more options. I like, I like uh, Green Lantern, Young Conan, Viking. Um, those are old dudes though. I mean, yeah, I've yeah, I just drawn two women back to back, but uh, um, let's let's have some options here. Only bring, bring only death. Yeah, that's. Archie, I've never, ever, ever drawn any Archie characters. I, I honestly don't know how I'd approach it. That's an interesting thought. That is a really, really interesting thought. That's okay. Okay. Also, here's 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 some counterpoints. I'm looking at the toys in my studio. I actually have uh, a xenomorph in my studio. I would more than happily draw Alien um or predator i think my son had asked for an alien alien versus predator drawing so i could theoretically start that in the live stream casper <laughs> problem with casper if he doesn't look like the harvey character model um it, it's not casper um so i have to i remember years ago i drew um scrooge mcduck and I rendered him in my style. Um, I think that worked. Samurai Predator versus Xenomorph. That's interesting. All right. I can, I can give like uh, Japanese influenced body armor and stuff. Oh, oh my God. Those really, really messed up samurai masks as a predator mask. That's kind of cool. Okay. That's, I'm, I, I might. Zeno versus Archie. <laughs> From Shogun. Yeah, yeah, I'll say it again. If you're not watching Shogun, you're missing out. I'm doing what I normally do with a series I hear really good things about. I let it, I, uh, I didn't start watching Shogun until there were five episodes available. That way I can watch, I can watch two at a time, which feels like about a movie. So I get a nice solid chunk of entertainment and then I only watch two the next week. And it, it means I, I'm very much on top of the story. Um, I don't lose track as much. Um, sitting with it for two hours means it feels like the, like the narrative stuff stays in my head better. Uh, where if I watch one episode, I might, I might lose it. If I watch three or four episodes, I know I can lose it. I made the mistake of letting the streaming service roll into a third episode. And I was still up for it and I was watching it. It was, um, um, if, if you're watching a series, the one where they go to the brothel or the, the Willow House. 
And I had to rewatch it because it was just too much for me to take in. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that would be, I, uh, I'd be pretty blotto pretty fast. It would have to be with beer, not my usual, my favorite whiskeys. Although right now my favorite whiskey is uh, uh, Japanese whiskey, so that'd be too on point. Uh, Jughead chest burster. Oh, you know what? I could do, I, I was a fan of the first season of the Netflix Sabrina series. I, I love that actress. I, I love that. I, I could do a, a hor nice horror Sabrina piece. That would be nice. Um, Archie versus Alien. That would be Veronica running around with a flamethrower. Now, uh, Reggie, Archie, Jughead, Moose. Everyone's everyone's dead. Hellboy versus Sabrina. That would be good. <laughs> so you remember that series with the brothers who were going around killing monsters? Um, Supernatural. They at the same time there was that vampire series running, and they were joking. And I wish they did this, where the last season of that vampire series they they wrap it up and then they do a post credits thing where the Supernatural Brothers pull into town saying, yeah, I guess we're here to kill vampires. Um, that would have been fun. There's some really, really cool. I, I love I love my Junji Ito, um, but his stuff is so distinct. It would be like such fan service to draw that stuff. Um, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, there was an anime of Supernatural and I missed it? Because that 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 show was very much a guilty pleasure for me. I mean, it was it was it was cheesy as hell, uh, but it, it never stopped being entertaining. Um, okay, now I think we're at risk of Hellboy versus Hot Stuff. No, Hot Stuff is Hellboy. That would probably be something I could actually do in one session, <laughs> not have to finish it over the week. Hellboy, Hellboy at sea. I like that. Oh, my God. All right, we're getting way too many good ideas. Uh, I'm going to ruminate. Uh, I'll uh, commit to making up my mind by Wednesday when I when I schedule the stream and everything. Some really good ideas here, guys. Um, I'll, I'll finish this this week. I might not even post it this week because I, I got the Storm and Hellboy piece to post this week. So I'll post it. I'll, I'll show you. I'll put it on my Patreon. That reminds me, everyone, if you want to see the behind-the-scenes work, you want to see stuff before anyone else sees it, you want to see covers months in advance of anyone else see it, seeing it, uh, my $1 a month Patreon, Richard uh, Pace on Patreon, um, it supports me. Um, right now we're at the point where it, it used to be you'd buy me a tank of gas. Now we're at the point where it pays my internet every month. Um so that's, that's great. So supporting my Patreon would be great. Otherwise, subscribing and liking my videos, uh, commenting uh, after after they go, um, after they're like sitting on the site, apparently commenting increases the visibility. Um, so you can actually th throw more suggestions in the comments. Um, my Instagram is Richard underscore Pace on Instagram. Please follow me, like my work. Uh, it helps more people see it. Um, and of course I got my art shop, but that's linked everywhere. I want everyone to have uh, a great week. Thank you so much for hanging out and chatting because that just makes makes these streams so much more enjoyable for me and I hope for you. Um, seven days, I'll be back here. I haven't I haven't missed one yet. No, I, I've actually done a number of streams where I've been sick. There was like one point in January where I had a really nasty jaw infection, and I, I did the stream. And I don't think I, I I don't think I talked about it. Uh, you guys have a great night. See you in a week. Have an amazing week. And in seven days, we'll be back with more books to show off. And I'll have made up my mind of one of the cool things, cool things uh, that you guys suggested. Have a great, oh, thank you so much, Uro Studio. At some point, I'm going to have to learn these people's names so it's not saying Uro Studio because I'm sure that's not the name your parents gave you. All right, everyone, have a great night.